So the question is, you know, does the size factor um, still have a, a place uh, in investors' multi-factor portfolio? So in other words, does the size factor um, still add value? Or uh, again, put differently, is, is there actually any size premium uh, or any size effect uh, that investors can, can benefit uh, from? And so recently there was, um, you know, lots of negative uh, conclusions on, on, on the size factor. Uh, so we've, we've um, looked at uh, several studies from smart beta providers. And these studies quite clearly state that, you know, th there really isn't any value added in, um, you know, tilting towards the size factor. Um, so a recent example um, by uh, Astus in, in earlier this year, uh, with a clear conclusion, there is no size effect. I think that was even the, the, the title um, that, was, that was used. Um, even earlier on, so, so this recent um, paper didn't really come as a surprise. Uh, so even earlier on, there are papers from, from different uh, factor providers, smart beta providers, uh, that are actually quite negative uh, about the size factor. So you have one quote here um, from 2018. Uh, so the argument there basically is, well, size actually has a lot of, or gets a lot of attention. And the authors think that's uh, really not appropriate given that um, other factors have much stronger evidence uh, supposedly behind them. Uh, also an earlier paper from 2016 concludes that size doesn't actually have attractive, um, attractive performance. And so this is interesting. So, because if you look at this, so these are um, papers from um, actually fans of factor investing and, and, and you know, pro providers of uh, factor investing. So, you know, these guys are, they like factors. Apparently they, they, they think that uh, factors can add value, but they just, they don't like the size factor. So, so the conclusion is clearly that uh, you know, size is is just one of those factors that um, that that we shouldn't be we shouldn't be interested in or we shouldn't be in, in investing in. Um, and so uh, we really um, you know wanted to uh, go back to this question and um, just to to give you the uh, the idea behind our studies. So we actually went back and we really confirmed these findings. So we don't disagree on these on the facts uh, that are reported in these papers. However, uh, we don't actually um, come to the same conclusion. Uh, and actually what we argue is that, um, you know, even though um, you can show that, you know, size doesn't have a high sharp ratio, uh, doesn't have a spectacularly high return uh, compared to other factors, that doesn't tell us anything about the value added of, of the size factor. And so the key issue really that is uh, missing in all of these studies is really the question of uh, interaction. And so what we show um, is that, um, you know, when you address that question of value added in a portfolio, um, you should properly account for the interaction of the size factor with other factors that um, the investor may hold. And accounting for this interaction completely changes the, the conclusion. Uh, so we do establish uh, a, a, a very significant size premium when you account for other, you account for other uh, factors. Um, and so this is uh, something that we published. So you have access to the, uh, to the full publication if, if you're interested in the details. Uh, what I'll do here is I'll just provide a summary of some of the key findings in, in, our, in our paper, um, which you see, which you see shown, shown here. Now, um, as I mentioned, the key issue that um, we really bring into this analysis is, is the question of interaction. And so the size factor um, is seen as a very useful factor if you account for how it interacts with, with other factors. Now, if you ignore how the size factor in interacts with you know, value, momentum, low risk, investment, profitability, and similar factors, well, you know, you're not getting to a conclusion that is relevant to an investor because you know, investors easily have access to these additional factors. So it doesn't make sense to uh, even investigate whether you know, investing only in the size factor and ignoring all the other factors would add value. And yet this is what these previous studies basically do. The, the studies I cited, they really look at size uh, in isolation. And I can give you a simple analogy. So if you think about the role of, of calcium uh, as, as a dietary supplement, so people who um, are at risk of osteoporosis, they may take in calcium uh, to strengthen their bones. 
Well, you could produce a study probably that concludes that, you know, increasing calcium intake doesn't add any value because if you look at people who have a deficiency in vitamin D, uh, you know, adding more calcium is not going to add any value. Uh, however, because, you know, the body cannot actually, um, you know, absorb that calcium and, and like build it into, in, in, into, into stronger bones. And so you have to combine vitamin D and calcium. So among, uh, you know, people who have access to vitamin D, calcium is obviously very useful. And, and so what we're doing here is basically some, something that is quite similar. Uh, we're just saying that investors do have access to other factors. And so let's look at the role of size when you do have access to these other factors. Now, um, as I mentioned, smart beta providers clearly um, in the studies that I mentioned um, take an issue with size. And basically what they claim is that, well, size doesn't have high performance. Uh, compared to the other factors. Uh, obviously, that's not the question investors have. They don't ask, should I, you know, shed all my other factor exposures and only invest in the size factors? So they're not, you know, comparing, um, you know, uh, uh, either the other factors or the size factor. They, they want to know what happens when you add size to the existing factors. Now, academic studies um, take a very different perspective. So academic studies are interested in, you know, building empirical asset pricing models. And so these models are supposed to explain uh, the cross-section of expected stock returns. So basically these, these factor models are supposed to um, explain what, uh, you know, what creates the difference in, in returns, so long-term average returns across different portfolios. And so the question here is not, does size have a high you know, spectacular return? The question is, does the size factor have some information about returns, about long-term average returns that is not already included in the other factors. Um, and so, so that's what um, academic studies look at. And interestingly, I think the question of investors is much closer to the question of the academic studies than it is to what providers talk about. Because investors just want to know how does actually size contribute to their portfolio risk and return when, when they use it um, alongside the other factors that, that they have. So to, to um, consider what happens when you account for interaction, um, a, a first thing you can do is you just look at the recent academic models. Okay, so the size factor has been around for a long time um, in, the, in the academic uh, literature, going back to, the, to an early paper in, in the 1980s. Um, so what is the conclusion in the most recent papers that try to come up with a, a set of factors that does a good job at explaining the differences in, in returns uh, across different equity portfolios or, or across different stocks. Well, you see here an overview of, um, you know, some of the most recent models by, uh, by, by Farm and French, by, by Lu Zhang and, and co-authors. So these are kind of the current workhorse models that, you know, people use to, um, you know, evaluate performance or to compute uh, normal returns of, of investment strategies. And if you look at these uh, models, you know, what, what is quite striking is that, well, they don't agree on the set of factors. So clearly you find some differences, right? So the, um, you know, the, 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 the Q factor model, for example, Ho Shui Zhang 2015, um, it doesn't actually have a value factor. It has a low investment and high profitability factor. Um, if you look at the Pharma French 2018 factor, it it actually does have the value factor, but it also has a momentum factor, which for example, Ho Shui Zhang don't, don't have. Now there's one thing that all these models agree on and that is the size factor. So across these different models, the size factor is, is included. So it seems surprising that you have, you know, on the one hand, smart beta providers claiming that, you know, there is no size premium and, and there is no size effect. On, on the other hand, all of these you know, very recent uh, kind of very state-of-the-art empirical asset pricing models agree on including the size factor, okay? even though they, they, they may disagree on, on, on some of the other factors. And uh, the explanation really behind that difference is quite clearly that, um, you know, these, um, these, the, this research that tests factor models does account for interaction. So the size factor is included if it adds to the explanatory power of the model given you know, the presence of all the other factors. So none of these uh, factor models co even considers what is the role of size in isolation. It, it only looks at what is the role of size when uh, the other factors are also present, right? So what is kind of the independent information um, in size? And, and again, interesting, that's exactly uh, 
uh, what is relevant for investors. So um, we would we were just um, interested in illustrating a bit the role of of, of size in these in these uh, multi-factor models. Uh, so what we did is we looked at um, uh, the question of the the fit or the misfit uh, of an asset pricing model. So we looked at uh, you know, different portfolios that we create by sorting on, on, on different uh, characteristics. And when, then we're using these uh, different factor models to explain the return differences in these, in these portfolios. So you want to explain, um, you know, uh, ideally uh, all, of the, all of the return differences. And so here what we are showing is just a measure of model uh, misfit. So this shows a quantity of unexplained uh, returns. And we're just looking at what happens when you exclude um, one of the factors from the model. So you see that, for example, excluding the low risk factor or even the low investment factor uh, doesn't actually reduce the, uh, the model fit. Okay, so the model misfit um, doesn't actually increase from omitting these factors in, in the sample of, of US uh, data that we look at. Uh, however, excluding the size factor actually has a large, uh, leads to a large increase in the model misfit. And, and it's actually the largest um, um, increase of model misfit uh, relative to all the other factors. So this statement that somehow the attention that we pay to the size factor is disproportionate given the you know, importance of other factors. Uh, well, clearly this picture suggests uh, the opposite. It suggests in a way that size is um, actually the most important factor. So if we drop size from the menu, we get the highest increase in, uh, in model misfit. And, and again, um, the explanation behind that is simply that um, you know, size may not have uh, a, an interesting or a very high standalone return, but it just carries information that the, about returns that the other factors don't carry. Now, um, let's move to the question of, of a premium, okay? And we look at two different, um, we look at the premium from two different angles here. So the first angle is, well, we're only going to look at return. So this is exactly the standalone perspective. It's similar to what uh, some of these provider studies do so you could you know just look at the average return perhaps adjust for the for only the market factor the, the picture you get is quite similar uh, so what we see here is that all of these um, six standard factors we look at carry a significant premium so you have the monthly average premium here and and the associated t statistic so actually all of them have a t statistic that is is larger than two so you would conclude that uh, these uh, values are um, you know, significant at, at conventional levels. However, we do see that, well, this average return of size is not spectacular. It's only 24 basis points per month. Uh, that looks quite small compared to, for example, momentum and also low risk. Uh, so momentum and low risk have something like, you know, three times uh, the, the returns uh, compared to the returns of the size factor. And this is probably what explains the, you know, negative press that the size factor gets Clearly, there are factors that have higher standalone returns. Now, this average return is, however, only interesting for an investor if you're planning to invest 100% of your portfolio in the size factor. If you also have other factors in the menu, you're not interested in the simple average return. You're actually interested in the return after it has been adjusted for other factor exposures, right? So the question here is, what is actually the additional uh, return or the value added of, of the size factor if you account for the exposure that this factor will have to some of the other factors. And, and here you see a very interesting picture. So the adjusted return for the size factor um, is actually identical to its, its simple return unadjusted for the factor. So that means after you adjust for all of the implicit exposures that the size factor has to, to these other factors, you still get the same amount of long-term average return. Okay, so in, in let's say on, on average, none of that return can be explained away by exposure to the other factors. Now, the picture is very different if you look, for example, at the momentum and the low risk factor. So these factors had much higher returns on a standalone basis. But what happens when you adjust, say, the low risk factor for its exposures to, to the other factor? Well, the adjusted return goes to 30 basis points. So you go from something like 80 basis points to 30 basis points. So what's the explanation behind that? Well, basically, uh, as we will see, the low risk factor, you know, has quite pronounced exposures to factors like uh, profitability, um, investment, 
and and um, you know value to some extent. And so, if you account for these exposures, the additional value added from uh, exposure to the low risk factor is is actually much lower than uh, what you would conclude from the from the standalone performance. Now, again, this this adjusted return is a good measure of value added because it's directly related to what happens to an investor's portfolio. So this adjusted premium, okay, if that is positive, what that means is that an investor can actually improve his Sharpe ratio by including that factor in, in his portfolio, right? So what this positive value suggests is that clearly including size in a portfolio um, does add value. And, and the picture we get for size is not that different than, than the picture we get for the other factors. So, you know, the size premium was the lowest um, among all of these factors here. Once you look at the adjusted premium, uh, well, it's actually kind of average, right? It doesn't look uh, worse. It's actually, um, you know, only lower than momentum and, and low risk. Um, it's in line or higher than uh, the premium for the other factors. Now, um, you can... Um, go into a bit more detail and to, to kind of explain this finding. So obviously, um, why do you get a lower adjusted return, for example, for the low risk factor? Well, simply because the low risk factor actually has uh, quite pronounced exposures to some of the other factors. And, and you can see this here, if you look at the, uh, the column with, uh, with the title low risk, uh, you can see the exposure to some of the other factors. And you can see, for example, a, a pronounced exposure of the low risk factor to the high profitability factor. Okay, a, a factor exposure of factor beta of 0.53 um, with you know, a T statistic close to 10, so very significant and economically large exposure to high profitability. Um, also, we have high exposure to the low investment factor. We have some exposure to the momentum factor. Uh, we have some exposure to the value factor. So the low risk factor, um, you know, some of its performance, some of its returns are simply generated from exposures that you pick up to some of the other factors. And, and, and so that part that you can explain away with exposure to the other factor, well, that's not gonna add any value to the portfolio. Now for low risk, um, there's still some value added left after adjusting for these factors. But you know, for the size factor, we have a, a, a somewhat different picture. So for the size factor, we can see that all of these exposures are actually quite low. Uh, and in particular, if you look at high profitability and low investment, what you see is negative exposures, okay? So uh, the size factor actually provides negative exposure to high profitability and low investment. Um, and then adjusting for this exposure, you're still getting um, you know, uh, some value added. And, and, and also what you see, you do get positive returns from the factor despite some of these negative exposures. And so that means that adding this factor to, uh, for example, profitability and low investment exposure would actually increase the, um, the portfolio sharp ratio. Now, um, I, I made this argument about, you know, when we measure the value added, the right way to do that is clearly we need to adjust uh, for all of the other factors. And I said, well, if that adjusted value added, that adjusted premium is positive, this implies that uh, such a factor would actually have a positive um, impact on, on the investor's portfolio and would receive a positive weight in an investor's optimal portfolio. So let, let's look at that more directly of, of this implication for investors' portfolios. What we looked at here is simply the weight that a given factor receives in, in a mean variance optimal portfolio. So, you know, I admit this is quite a stylized case. We're just looking at a simple uh, mean variance investors. You can, you know, you could look at different types of uh, portfolios. Um, but if you look at these mean variance portfolios, you can see that all of these factors receive a positive weight. And that's just in line with the fact that all of these factors also have um, you know, adjusted returns or, or adjusted value added that is, that is positive. But look at the magnitude of the weight of the size factor. So the size factor gets a weight of 9% in this portfolio. Now that weight doesn't look very different from the weight of something like 11 or 12% that the momentum factor and, and the low risk factor uh, get. Now think back to the standalone return of these factors. So the, the, we saw that the momentum factor and the low risk factor, they had about three times the standalone return of the size factor. So even though they have three times the, the average return, 
they only get a, a marginally higher weight. And why is that? Why does the size factor get um, a weight that is almost identical to momentum and low risk despite the, the low returns? Well, that it's simply the case because you know, of what we've seen, the size factor has performance that is not explained by exposure to these, to these other factors, whereas that's the case for momentum and low risk. So in other words, the, the size factor is a good diversifier. And so even though it doesn't have stellar returns, um, optimal portfolios that allocate across factors will allocate a, a significant fraction um, to, the, to the size factor. So uh, clearly we see here that um, you know, the size factor does, uh, does play a role and gets a weight that is actually similar to some of the, to some of the other factors. Now, um, let's look at this, um, this, this diversification potential of the size factor in, in a little more, more detail. So obviously, so far, uh, our analysis um, is you know, victim of the, the sample that we look at. Uh, so we look at a long-term uh, US sample, you know, which is very standard. Um, and, and we basically show that given the historical average return of these factors, um, they all play a role in an investor's portfolio, and, and that includes the size factor. So given the historical level of return of the size factor, this is an, an attractive factor to hold in an investor's portfolio. Now let's look at this um, question of uh, the role of factors in a portfolio from a different perspective. So the idea here for us is to move a bit beyond the, the average return observed in the sample. And so what we're asking here is, what is actually the indifference level of average return? So given the, the risk uh, characteristics of all of these factors, what we're asking here is, well, what is actually the, uh, the, the, the return, the average return that you would need from a given factor in order to um, you know, just include it in the portfolio, in order to just um, you know, put the weight above, above zero and start including this factor. And, and this is where the uh, conclusion, again, is, is quite interesting and confirms the previous results. So um, look at the low risk factor, for example. So this was an example of a factor that has a very high return, but we also saw that a lot of that return is simply explained by exposure to some of the other factors. So what is the return level um, historically? Well, it was something like 80 basis points. So now we look at what is the indifference level? So what is the return level that we actually need to assume so that the low risk factor uh, will just start to get a positive weight. Um, and we can see that this indifference level of average return is about 52 basis points. So what this says is given the high uh, relation uh, that, uh, or, or the strong dependency that the low risk factor has with the other factors, you know, an investor should only include it if it has returns of at least 52 basis points per month. Okay, so we actually do require quite a high return in order to motivate an inclusion of that factor. Now, it turns out that for the size factor, that indifference level of average return is actually very low. It's actually very close to zero. And this clearly shows that you know, the size factor has a strong uh, diversification uh, capacity. And so it adds diversification to the portfolio, you know, so much so that you would really only need a very low average return to motivate its inclusion in um, in, in, in a multi-factor portfolio. Now, the, the size factor in that respect is actually quite similar to uh, two other factors. So one of them is high profitability and one of them is momentum. If you look at high profitability and momentum, so these are two factors that have very low indifference level uh, of average return. Again, what that means is that, well, these factors, they have, uh, you know, they're quite independent from, uh, from the other factors. And so adding them to a multi-factor portfolio uh, provide strong benefits, even if uh, the uh, the average returns of these factors are not um, are not very high. So simply because of the risk properties of these factors, they will add value to uh, to an investor's uh, portfolio. So again, this you know just confirms that uh, even though size may not have the strongest return, um, you know it's it's a useful inclusion or it's useful addition to a portfolio. It's useful to include it in the portfolio. And you know, more generally, we see that you know, for some factors, if you consider their risk properties, we don't actually need very high standalone returns um, to include them. Um, and so looking just at standalone returns um, is simply not uh, the right way to analyze whether these factors add value. Now, um, we already mentioned, so why does the size factor have these, these, um, this diversification capacity? Why is it included 
in optimal portfolios, even if it has a fairly low return. And the answer, of course, is that it's, you know, it's fairly independent from, uh, from, from the other factors. And actually, um, if you look at the correlations, you can see that the size factor actually has negative uh, correlation with, uh, with standard factors. So that is negative correlation with the value factor, momentum factor, almost zero with, uh, with the low risk factor, a negative correlation with the profitability and also the investment factor. So given these negative correlations, it's clear that adding uh, you know, the size factor to a multi-factor portfolio um, will provide you with risk reduction benefits. And so um, even if the size factor has just moderately positive returns, it is a useful addition to a portfolio. Uh, we can look at diversification properties from a different perspective. So let's move uh, beyond correlations and let's look a little bit at how these different factors behave in, in different um, macroeconomic uh, conditions. And so here we're just looking at how these factors behave when uh, there's shocks to short-term interest rates. And here we have uh, strong confirmation that the size factor is interesting because it's different from the other factors. So if you look at relationship with interest rate shocks, you can see that, um, for example, the value factor has very um, negative returns when there's strong um, um, uh, shocks to the short rate, uh, you know, same for the low risk uh, factor, and you have the same for the low investment factor. So three uh, out of these factors have very strong negative dependency on interest rate shocks. Um, and that's actually very well documented. So it's, it's very well known, for example, that low risk stocks tend to be bond-like stocks. Okay, so when interest rates rise unexpectedly, that's bad news for bonds, but it's also bad news for bond-like stocks. And so low risk stocks and the low risk factor tend to suffer when um, interest rates uh, rise unexpectedly. Uh, there's a similar finding for the, the um, for, 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 for value stocks um, and, and a similar finding for, for low investment stocks, which, you know, with quite a um, a similar similar rationale. Um, and so the size factor stands out because the size factor actually benefits from uh, these interest rate shocks. And that just confirms that um, size has a useful role. So if your objective was, for example, to, to construct a portfolio um, that, that allows you to get uh, the least dependence on, on interest rate shocks, um, the size factor would actually get a weight of, of, of uh, even a little more than 40%. Uh, so clearly this confirms this idea that um, size is, is quite different from other factors and that um, means that it plays an uh, important role in investors' portfolios. Now to, to um, kind of wrap up this um, uh, analysis, uh, I'd just like to provide you with a summary. Um, and what we look at here is just an evaluation of the size factor. So again, in this US long-term data that we looked at, and we compare that to two things. So we compare the size factor to the average of the remaining factors. So these are the other, uh, you know, five factors in our, in our menu of six standard factors. And we also compare it to the worst performing factor among, among the, other, the other five factors. And the first thing is to look at the premium in isolation. So looking at the premium in isolation is basically what a lot of smart beta providers did in their research. And looking at the results here, you kind of, you know, understand their conclusion so I showed this quote stating that, you know, size really gets a lot of attention. It seems disproportionate given that, you know, the other factors have stronger evidence. Um, if you look at the average standalone return of the remaining factors other than size, that's 47 basis points. That's about double uh, the value uh, of the size, uh, the size return. So given that, you know, other factors give you twice the return of the size factor in, in this um, historical US uh, data, you can understand this, this claim, right? So yes, why care about size if it only gives you half the return? Now, as we discussed, uh, investors clearly uh, don't uh, care about standalone returns. They're unlikely to invest 100% of their portfolio in, in the size factor. So they care about value added after accounting for interaction effects, right? Just like, you know, we would like to figure out how calcium helps us when we can also have access to vitamin D. So, so this is really the question of interaction. And all the remaining um, numbers in this table tell us something about the value added of, of the size factor uh, when you account for interaction effects. So the premium is actually still 24 basis points, and that's about the same as the average of the remaining factors. It's much better than the worst performing factor. Um, the, we've seen the model deterioration, so how much um, 
you know, do you increase the model misfit when you exclude the size factor? That's a huge deterioration you get when size is excluded. Uh, so clearly size here has a, a, you know, a very important role, 22% uh, deterioration, whereas you include the any of the remaining factors on average, you would only get a 2% deterioration. So some of the factors even um, in the sample, they were slightly, omitting them would slightly improve the model fit. So clearly looking at these numbers of model deterioration and, and model fit, um, you can make the case that size is somehow the odd one out that should play less of a role. Um, it seems like it's quite the opposite. Um, if you look at the weight and optimal portfolios, whether it's mean variance or macro aware portfolios, you can see that the weight uh, given to the size factor um, is, is actually you know, similar to the average um, of, of, of the remaining factors. And so none of this, um, none of these results, um, when you take into account interaction, would suggest that uh, the size factor has a lesser role uh, compared to the compared to the other factors. Now, um, are these results that we present are they surprising? Well, it's pretty clear that our results are not surprising. So we're clearly not um, alone and not the first to show that the size factor does have a significant premium. Uh, again, I. I cited these empirical asset pricing models. So all of them include the size factor. Um, so, you know, these authors will probably tell us what, what are you even talking about? Of course, we have the size factor in our models, right? So that's pretty consensual in the academic literature. So we don't really need you to tell us that, uh, you know, the size factor is, is, is a relevant factor. Uh, so we are only here with this study, you know, because we're building on uh, claims which, um, you know, just ignore interaction effects and, and just come to a conclusion which is, you know, which is clearly in the data. Uh, they come to findings which are clearly in the data, but which are just not relevant uh, for, for investors. Um, and now there's this um, early evidence, uh, even looking at this question quite explicitly and, and, you know, in many ways very similar to what we're doing. So there's a paper in 2018 from, from Asnus and co-authors where they find that there is a significant size premium uh, that actually you know, emerges when you account for the other factors. And th that's, you know, very similar in spirit to what we do. And, and it's really interesting to read this conclusion. So, um, you know, they are really, you know, making a very strong case um, that, uh, you know, there is a significant size premium and that's, that, that's like a very robust finding. So they say it's robust, you know, to specification. It's not just concentrated in micro caps. It's, you know, it's consistent across seasons. You find it even for alternative measures of size. It holds in, you know, all kinds of different industries. It holds across, you know, a bunch of international equity markets. So, you know, this empirical fact is, is clearly, you know, quite consensual that once you control for other factors, there is a significant size premium. Now, we make the case here that this also implies that a, a, a simple exposure to the simple size factor is a useful addition to a, a multi-factor portfolio. Okay, very clearly that's what, you know, the, if you will, the, um, you know, the interpretation of this kind of multi-factor alpha, this, this premium that we test, um, you know, if that's positive, it very directly means that including that factor in a multi-factor portfolio will improve uh, risk-adjusted returns. Um, now, you do, however, get claims in the industry um, making a different case. And so you do get this case that say, well, you know, you somehow have to create a complex size strategy that then hedges out all of the other factors. And that's really kind of the only way to add value with the size factor. And that may be very difficult to implement. And so, you know, finally, um, we still don't like the size factor. Now, that argument is clearly, um, you know, it's, 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 it's clearly not a strong argument because um, again, you know, what the significant positive premium implies is that if you're adding a position in the size factor to the other standard factors, that will improve your Sharpe ratio. And, and you don't need to design a complex strategy that would somehow hedge out all these other risk exposures. Um, you know, it's similar to saying that value and momentum in combination work much better. You know, that doesn't mean that you have to design a complex value strategy that also somehow takes into account and hedges momentum, which could be difficult to implement. No, it just means that, you know, adding uh, a momentum exposure to your value exposure will, will improve your Sharpe ratio. And, and so in a similar way, adding uh, a size position, uh, size exposure to uh, other multi-factor exposures of, of these standard factors will improve um, the Sharpe ratio as we've seen in, in our uh, portfolio illustrations. 
So the conclusion is, is, is quite uh, straightforward. Um, so for the size factor and, and as concerns uh, the size factor, clearly if you want to pick the, you know, the highest performing factor, um, you know, size wasn't the right choice, at least not historically. But if you're interested in holding a diversified multi-factor portfolio, well, size is a valuable addition um, in, in that portfolio. And beyond the question of the size factor, uh, what this analysis also tells us is that, um, you know, when you analyze uh, the value of factors, you clearly sh shouldn't look at uh, the standalone performance. Uh, you, also, you also have to account uh, for interaction. Um, and this is an important point, you know, whichever factor you, you consider, clearly uh, we need to consider what is the benefit um, of adding a factor to um, the other factors in the menu, uh, rather than looking at uh, effect and isolation. So thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I think, Severin, we have time for questions. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Felix. Uh, yes, we have already received uh, some questions. Um, so the first question is, the size factor is not easy to define in other asset classes uh, outside equities. In that sense, isn't size a weaker factor? Yes, so thank you for, for this um, question on other asset classes. So. Um, you know, there is an argument that um, some of the standard factors um, actually that we find in, in equity uh, portfolios also uh, matter across asset classes. Um, and that's the case of momentum, for example, quite, quite clearly. Um, now, it's not always obvious to extend all of these factors to other asset classes. I think that's, um, that's not... Um, a problem that is really specific to the to the size factor. Even when you think about value and fixed income, it never looks very different from from how you define value in um, in, in in equities. Um, but I I have seen studies that do uh, construct a size factor in, in corporate bonds, for example, just looking at the size of the issuer. Um, in 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 that case, um, you also have these alternative measures of size of a, of a company that. Um, you can definitely apply to uh, to corporate to corporate bonds. Uh, obviously, in other asset classes like commodities, etc., this may be this may be different. But that's not specific to the size factor. That is also the case for things like uh, profitability and, and investment. And you know, ultimately, I think you have a deeper question, which is: so should we expect that um, we find the exact same factors in all asset classes? And, and so, it could be the case that in fixed income investing, you have, uh, you have different factors. So there's an emerging literature on factors in corporate bonds. So some papers claim that, um, you know, the same factors that we have in equities, they're also at work in corporate bonds. Uh, you have other factors that are much more skeptical about that and, you know, argue that uh, you actually need an entirely different set of factors. Um, so that's, I think, um, an open question of what is the good set of factors in, let's say, the fixed income world where things are less developed than, uh, than an equity. Um, but um, as, as far as the size factor is concerned, I, it's, you, know, you can construct it in, uh, for example, copper bonds, uh, certainly not across um, all asset classes. But you know, from the perspective of an equity investor, if, if there is an equity, if there is a size factor in equity, um, you know, as an investor, I don't care that you cannot deliver a size factor in, in commodities, right? I should think about how to construct my equity portfolio. And if size adds value there, uh, you know, that's what, what matters for an equity investor. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, another question is uh, size and value factors are more researched as compared to other factors. However, with recent performance of value factor and no questioning relevance of size factor, can we say that factor investing on steady load basis is dead and only way is multi-factor portfolio? Yeah, I think so. The, the I think since the you know the, really the emergence of um, factor investing and you know probably going back to um, you know or you know kind of the early studies in, in I think two thousand eight two thousand nine uh, that looked at the you know the Norway portfolio of the of the uh, the Norwegian um, uh, the Norwegian oil fund. Um, I think the idea was always that there is a you know, there's a number of uh, factors. Uh, that really are at, at play and, and that you should think about 
um, you know, whether these factors drive the performance of active managers. And so if that's the case, then, um, you know, you could actually invest in these factors directly that would be more transparent and, and that would be lower cost. Uh, and so from there on, we've actually seen the emergence of, you know, investable products, uh, lots of indices, ETFs um, that look at different factors. And I think quite early on, um, you know, at least something like around 2013, 14, uh, the main trend was that uh, clearly people realized that they need to combine different um, different factors, um, and and that has obvious obvious benefits. Um, now, size and value, it's true, are some of the earliest factors. I think that's especially true in the industry because if you look at you know how institutional investors used to define their mandates, you know, it was you know kind of, these were the traditional styles that you know you basically said well we have a large cap growth mandate or a small cap uh, value mandate. Um, in I think in the um, in, in in the literature, the importance of other factors uh, has been quite prominent for a while, um, and and so I think it's you know be difficult to claim that um, you know somehow the you know say size and value have stronger evidence than the the other factors, whether it's empirical or theoretical evidence. Clearly, factors like profitability, um, investment momentum, um, you know, have both empirical and, and theoretical evidence. Uh, and so from that perspective, um, you know, a lot of um, institutional investors, for example, would, would uh, clearly choose these additional factors along, um, along size and value. Um, and, and I think just combining uh, factors has, you know, obvious benefits um, of in, in kind of managing some of the short-term risk. And so, yes, I think definitely the um, factor investing is, is less and less about selecting single factors. Thank you. Um, another question. Size factor has, <clears throat> sorry, size factor has not had a negative correlation to value in recent years. Has something changed? So the, you can model like um, the correlation of all of these factors, obviously, as, as you know, uh, time varying. Uh, what we do, and and there's some um, you know there's lots of studies that uh, that do that. Um, of, of course, what we do here is we just look at a long term. Uh, we look at a long-term analysis. Um, what we, um, you know, observe is obviously that both size and value are exposed to uh, macro factors, and so um, you know some of these exposures um, are, you know, are, are divergent. So we've seen, for example, in terms of um, in terms of interest rate exposure, um, you know, they're almost opposite. And so if uh, movements in in markets are you know driven by shocks to interest rates. You would expect them to behave very differently. Um, then uh, the exposure of size and value, you know, will be more aligned on on some of the other uh, macro factors. And so then, if those um, if those those factors, for example, things like um, uh, just a rise in um, you know in, in, in macro uncertainty, for example, or other other macro conditions. Uh, where the these factors have more similar exposure, if that kind of becomes the main driver of short-term returns, then you would um, expect correlation to uh, turn positive um, over over short periods of time. But what we're interested in here is really kind of the long-term uh, long-term premium and what what explains the long-term premium, um, and that's where we see this very um, very low and 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 often negative correlations of size with the other factors. Okay, thank you. Um, doesn't the size factor become stronger if you eliminate junky small capitalization companies? Yeah, so the, so there are, um, so I mentioned this study, so you do have a, uh, or you could have an approach that, for example, you eliminate, um, well, actually all the, so size has negative exposures to some rewarded factors. So if you eliminate those quite mechanically, uh, you will get uh, higher returns. Uh, however, you don't you don't have to do that as an investor because you can do something different, which is basically you just um, you know if you invested in uh, let's say these non junk uh, factors, so you're actually invested in high profitability factor, you invested in the low investment factor. Uh, so in other words, these are kind of quality uh, quality related factors. Um, given that you know, the size factor behaves different from from those. You can actually add uh, size to your portfolio, and then uh, you will get an improvement in the Sharpe ratio. Um, if then you would still increase return, in principle, you could use uh, you know leverage or you could use an overlay to even drive up uh, returns even further. Um, you know, there's no reason per se why you would um, 
you know, have to pursue an approach where you invest into the uh, size factor while, um, if you will, eliminating some of the other stocks. You, you can do that, uh, but let's say that's not, that's not the, the only thing you can do. Much more simply, you can simply combine uh, the different factors um, and, and, and that would improve your sharp ratio. And if then you want additional return, you could use leverage or uh, an overlay to further to leverage up on those returns. Thank you. Uh, next, next, next question. Uh, have, have you also looked at the results when you split the sample into two sub-periods? For instance, at the last 30 and first 30 years, what um, would that ch change your conclusions? Yes, so we have done a, um, you know, the, so you have the full results in the, in, in the paper and we've also done uh, obviously supplementary analysis to that. So we have, uh, so the main, the main analysis that I showed is on, um, on US long-term data. Uh, so we had in the, in the publication process, we actually had uh, two referees with quite kind of extensive comments on the initial version. And so one of the things that they actually requested was to go beyond US data. So we also did this in international data and, and they also requested this kind of subsample analysis. Uh, so we find that this result um, is actually quite uh, robust across subsamples and it's quite robust um, also in developed ex-US data or international data. Um, and again, this is something that um, kind of this, this fact that uh, when you control for the other factors, that there is a size premium. This is something that is, is very robust. And if you go to the quote uh, that I showed of this 2018 paper that looks at um, you know, uh, the size premium when you adjust for other factors, I mean, kind of the language used there is quite strong. So they say they find it in all you know, 30 different industries, 24 different, uh, 24 different uh, countries. Um, and, and, and so the, this empirical fact is, is quite robust. I mean, surely you can find subsamples where you, where you don't confirm it, but in, in our analysis of subsamples and international data, uh, we clearly confirm this finding. And, and it's also uh, confirmed in, you know, in, in th this external paper that I mentioned. It's you know, also, as I mentioned, that the size factor is found to improve um, asset pricing models um, in the literature where you know, all these models are also subjected to robustness tests. So I think the kind of the, the, this stylized fact of this empirical finding is, is actually pretty well established be beyond even our analysis. Okay, thank you. Um, you showed a slide which focused on the effect of the factor regarding the interest rate re regime. Uh, is the size of the value factor really negative, like shown on the slide, like uh, Minvol? Yeah, so we, so our, um, um, we, we have this, um, uh, this analysis actually in the paper, and this actually draws on a, on a publication um, in the Journal of Portfolio Management, where we look quite closely at the macro uh, risk exposures of different factors. Um, so there, in that paper, we provide a bit more detail on, you know, if you will, how we construct the macro factors and actually report quite precisely what the exposures of the different factors are, also to different um, you know, kind of combinations of um, of macro of macro factors. Um, the low risk uh, proxy that we use here in the paper is actually a like a low beta factor, if you will. So we just draw on the kind of published uh, published factors that where people have uh, provided data on the on the on, on the factor returns. And um, for that, um, yeah, we have these these um, negative exposure to interest rates, which makes these stocks uh, bond-like. And uh, we do again, we do find the same for value um, stocks. Uh, but I think that also reflects that there is, I think, generally some overlap between uh, value stocks and um, and and, and low-risk uh, stocks. Uh, so there's usually some kind of positive uh, correlation between these two, um, and that's just confirmed in this. Um, in, the, in this factor, the, the, maybe the better known exposure for value stocks is, is more the exposure to the term spread uh, or to the long-term interest rates, uh, where you have this effect that you know, value stocks um, actually tend to have uh, you know, much shorter uh, cash flow duration than, than growth stocks. Uh, so in that sense, they will suffer less from uh, increases in the term spread. Um, so that's quite clear that on, on that end, um, in a way, they would be, uh, they would, you know, value stocks would be exposed differently from 
uh, from growth stocks. And so the value factor itself uh, would have quite a pronounced exposure to, to changes in, in the term spread. Um, that's probably the more kind of widely reported um, exposure. Uh, but again, on yes, on interest rate exposure, we find um, uh, we find this slightly. Let's say that it resembles to some extent defensive strategies. Thank you. Um, we still have time for a couple of questions. Um, next question is: Which contributes contributes um, most to the size factor, the long side or sh uh, short side? That's an excellent question. Um, so we didn't. We didn't analyze this here um, at all. We, we're just looking at all the factors as a kind of long versus short. Now, I know that obviously, that, so there's these dedicated papers on whether the result depends um, uh, depends in a pronounced way on on one of the sides of the uh, of the factor. Um, my, like my take on this is that so overall I don't think like I haven't seen clear results that um, somehow these standard factors are mainly driven by the short side but I also have maybe a slightly different take on this than, than you know what are sometimes um, here being discussed so uh, we are using long short factors in this analysis that doesn't mean that we're talking about long short investments so if a factor um, has a return that is mostly driven by the short side, um, you know, that's fine. That doesn't mean that I have to short to capture this, this return because um, if you have a long only strategy, um, basically the weights in the long short strategy, they kind of, um, you know, what, what is the weight in the long short strategy? So a short weight in the long short strategy just means that in a long only strategy, well, you're gonna underweight that stock. You're gonna have a negative active weight. And you know, negative active weights are not typically problematic to implement. You don't, in general, need shorting to have negative active weights. You just need to have lower weights than um, than, than than the benchmark. And so you could implement at least a, a, a large fraction of these negative weights. Um, you know, in a long only context, you could implement them without actually shorting because you would just basically have a lower weight than 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 the benchmark weight. And so the the looking at these long short factors, it's I think really just an analytical way of looking at return differences. So, you know, psi, I mean, value minus growth gives you a return difference. It doesn't mean you have to short growth stocks. Okay, you can get a value tilt in a, in a long only setting. Um, and even if the, the returns are strongly driven by the, you know, the growth component, let's say the underperformance of growth stocks over value stocks, well, you can capture that in a long only strategy because you, you can have negative active weights um, on growth stocks. So um, I think, um, you know, I, I haven't seen like any strong results that let's say these factors uh, are strongly driven by the short side, even though there's studies on that. But I also think it's, you know, it's, it's, it's just an, these long short strategies, they're just an analytical tool uh, of looking at return differences. So for a benchmark, constrained investor, yes, you would not, you would have a long only strategy. Um, and you would, it would be typically quite easy for you from an implementation perspective to actually have under weights relative to the benchmark. Uh, thank you. And uh, one last question, are the size uh, and other factors in your studies, the simple univariate factor portfolios, no factor my, my making portfolios that hedge away exposures to others? That's correct. So like the, the portfolios we look at, um, so we don't actually didn't create them ourselves for this study. So we basically get the data from, um, from, from, you know, the Kenneth French website where um, the factors are constructed in the simple kind of similar, uh, simple well-known fashion. So you just um, sort on uh, size first, uh, and then you sort on say a book to market for value or the past uh, 12 month returns um, omitting the last month for momentum, et cetera. And, and so we're just uh, looking at these factors. So there's no kind of control mechanism for, for other factors. Uh, okay, thank you, Felix. Um, so uh, I believe this is the end of our webinar today. Uh, I wanted to let you know that we will be sending you the materials and uh, the recording of this webinar very shortly. And of course, we remain at your disposal for any follow-up questions you may have. Uh, you can contact us uh, at any time at the email address webinar at scientificbeta.com. Thank you again, Felix, and uh, see you at the next webinar. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye.